All right, can everybody hear me okay? Um, just before I begin, I'm, just, I'm really honored to give the talk, um, you know, the, the plenary talk, Dave Beasley. Um, I'm actually stunned to see so many people out there. Um, I was actually chair of the Python conference in 1998 when it had about 200 people, and it just about killed me. Um, so uh, I would actually like to have everybody applaud Jesse Noller again. Just, I mean, it's just amazing. Um, so, so, so in doing this talk, um, I was sort of asked by the committee, um, why don't you come talk about something diabolical? So I have this on the, the slide here. And I gave that some thought. It's like, hmm, diabolical. Uh, I started thinking, what, like, what do I get out of coming to PyCon? And for me, the best part of PyCon is learning about new stuff. And so I actually decided to do this talk on a topic of which I knew nothing about prior to preparing it. And so let's talk about PyPy. Um, uh, essentially, PyPy, if you don't know, is Python implemented in Python, which at first glance, if you describe this to somebody, they'll think you're insane, right? It's like Python implemented in Python. Um, it is quite a bit faster than normal Python through various magic. Um, and just as an example of that, here is sort of some sample code that you can write. Has anybody actually seen this Mandelbrot set code on the web? I don't know whether Jeff is here or not, but if he is, he should come talk to me afterwards. We'll, uh uh, we'll sort you out. But this is, this is some code that renders a Mandelbrot, a Mandelbrot set. Uh, you run that in C Python, it takes about 500 seconds. You run it in PyPy, and it's like 200 seconds. Doing nothing, you know, just like a two and a half times speed up. Pretty amazing. Um, but this really doesn't even do PyPy justice, actually. I mean, I have some Mandelbrot set code of my own that I use sometimes in, uh, in training classes. And I try that, and I get it running 34 times faster. I mean, so I have the non-obfuscated, you know, Python code. I think that's just amazing. And the thing that I really like about this is that I don't have to do anything. I mean, I basically just download, uh, you know, PyPy and run it. This is also my attempt to subvert the PyCon conference with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, with uh, Perl programming. But, the, you know, there's, there's something there in PyPy where it's like, wow, this is great. I don't have to do C extensions. I don't have to, like, mess around with stuff. It just runs faster. So, so you can look at that project and you can say, okay, you know, it's clearly seems to be faster than, than C Python in many ways. And there's a lot of magic going on underneath the covers of PyPy. It's doing just-in-time compilation, it's doing translation to C, uh, a lot of very advanced optimization going on. But that's actually not what I want to talk about in this talk. So this is not really a performance talk. Um, what I really want to talk about is which one can you mess around with and maybe fix with a pocket knife or something like that, maybe uh, in the dark, or under a deadline, or, you know, you know, I actually have some experience with, actually, I'm a little bit curious, how many people ever drove, like, an old VW Bug? Oh, okay, I have a few, did, uh, did any of you have to fix it with, like, a screwdriver or duct tape or anything, like, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, so this is something that I actually have some experience with, um, and I would just like to comment for those of you at the tip boss last night, I hope you left the pizza guy a tip. Okay, because um, I drove a bug delivering pizza before I was doing programming. And I did have to actually fix it with a, a pocket knife from time to time. So, um, so, so what this talk is really, um, really about is just this idea of thinking about tinkering with PyPy. Is the PyPy project, with all of that performance, is that something that you can mess around with? And if so, how do you do it? So, um, and, I, and I think tinkering is something that's actually really important. I mean, if you think about CPython, you've got all the patches that people apply to it. Uh, you have the different PEPs that people propose. Um, you have extensions to it. And, and, and my, my favorite, you're going to love this, uh, you even have Python ideas, OK? So, um, so there's, you know, there's a whole ecosystem of, of of, of hacking on CPython, and to me it really matters. I mean, you know, a number of you saw, you know, like talks that I've given about the global interpreter lock. I wouldn't have been able to do that if I couldn't tinker with it. I mean, if it was, you know, that wasn't possible. Um, if I go further back in my history, I mean, one of the first things I did with Python was port it to the connection machine, which is a big parallel computer. And, you know, in doing that, we, we didn't look at Python for performance. We actually looked at it because we could hack on it. I mean, that was, it was like simple enough of an implementation that you could hack on it and do stuff with it. And just at the conference here, I think this tinkering stuff just makes cool stuff. I've been just been blown away by the sort of the IPython notebook stuff that I've been seeing. And I know there's like a ton of tinkering and messing around went into that. 
And so, so this question about PyPy, I mean, if, if, this, you know, if, if PyPy has the promise, and you know, oh, it's a great performance, and I, I, can, I can be totally lazy, and I don't have to think about anything, and run around, you know, just, just run it, I have this question, you know, is, is it something that you can mess around with? And how do you do it? Um, and I worry a little bit that it might just be this evil genius project. I mean, I actually worry that the programming model for PyPy may, might be that. Uh, this is, from the, this is uh, from the tutorial the other day. We have, you know, we have actually Mike Mueller up front with Alex, Magic, and Armin surrounding him. Those are the Pi Pi, some of the, you know, the PyPy core developers you know, uh, doing something. And so that, that's, that's actually something to think about. Um, and just as a little confession, um, I actually will admit that PyPy scares me a little bit. I don't know whether it scares anybody else, but it, it does scare me a little bit. Um, just because of the, you know, the lot of moving parts, a lot of pieces to it, I worry a lot about the complexity of it. You know, is it, is it like the, uh, the, you know, the super board from last year, or is it like a Cray 1, which is the same, you know, at the same time period, which is over on the right? So this, this question of, of you know, can you mess around with PyPy, I think it's an honest question to ask, and the answer is I don't know. I'm just going to admit that, okay, this is the punchline of this talk. I don't know whether you can mess around with it or not. But um, I decided to do an experiment with that. So that's, that's really what I'm going to talk about is this, just this experiment. Can you go in and mess around with PyPy? Doing it from scratch. Um, I have actually never done anything with the PyPy project before. Never contributed any patch to it. Um, I submitted like one bug report against the global interpreter lock because that's my duty. But that, that, that's like the, <laughs> the extent of it. And, and I sort of wanted to see whether I could do this just using what they provide, like source code, documentation, papers, and so forth. Um, there are some constraints. Um, I do have kids. Married. I'm trying to sell condos. Um, I have to run away from Julie Steele all the time because I'm like so far behind on the on the Python cookbook project. Um, you know, there's like so like other things going on. So this had to be sort of a part-time project. Um, and then just so you know, um, tinkering with PyPy to me is not the same as just using it. I mean, if I want to use it, just download it and use it. That's not very interesting. Um, and the other thing is that tinkering with it is not the same as creating it. Um, I don't have any illusion that I'm just going to download this and implement a JIT. Right? I mean, it's, you know, I'm not smart enough to do that. So what I'm thinking of is more things like bug reports, maybe make extensions to it, maybe patches, study it. Um, you guys need to start PyPy ideas, by the way, so and <laughs> post on there. Um, but, but that's really what I'm thinking about. So what I'm going to do is, is actually kind of take you through this sort of, you know, what it looks like to mess with this. And if, if you, you know, I would actually encourage you to kind of to follow along, although maybe I don't want all 1,800 people downloading it right this second off the... Uh, off the web page, but um, if you want to start, you know, go to pypy.org, and to mess with it, you really do need the source code. You know, that's, if you're going to, you know, source code is for tinkering, so go get that. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that PyPy is indeed a version of Python written in Python. This, is, this, this sort of blows your mind the first time you sort of see this, but um, if, you, if you go f download the, the, the source for PyPy, you'll get, you know, maybe like a PyPy 1.8 directory. And if you go in there, um, there, there's sort of a bin directory that you can find, and there's a script in there called py.py. And you run it under Python. I'm actually running it under Python 2.7 here. So you can, you can type that, and it will sit there and kind of um, think about it for a little bit. Um, it's a little bit frightening. It's running the C compiler at the moment. We'll talk about that later. Um, but it's, it's sitting there very slowly coming up. It's actually making Java look kind of good right now. So. <laughs> Wait just a second here for the, uh, okay, 18 seconds to start up, okay. So, but it is indeed a version of Python, uh, written in Python, okay, so you can type uh, Python code into it. Now, you probably would not want to use it like that. I mean, the performance of that is terrible. I think Alex Gaynor at one point told me it's like, what, like 2,000 times slower than Python or something. So, you, you wouldn't do that, um, and it turns out that, that what you really do with PyPy is you have to translate it into something else. And this is where um, like your head will start to spin a little bit if you look at this project. Essentially what they tell you to do is that if you want the really high performance version of PyPy, you've got to go through this translation step. So what that looks like, um, you know, let's, let's, let's get out of that. Um, you, they, they essentially tell you to go down into a deep subdirectory of the project and then you just run translate with some options, and then you just sit back. Okay, so um, now this actually takes a while. I'm going to talk about what, hap what happens here, but this is essentially 
building Pi Pi from source. I'm actually a little curious, how many people have actually done this, build Pi Pi from source? Okay, fair, fair number of you. Um, since I'm gonna live dangerously, I'm gonna leave that running on my machine on battery power. Um, it will serve as a, uh, as a natural cutoff for the end of the talk, probably in a uh, minute. So, um, so, you, so you can build that. Um, and, and actually one of the, 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 the sort of the most formidable or formidable things about PyPy, at least to me as an outsider, is actually this build process. Um, this, is a, this is a little movie of what it does running significantly faster, okay? So if you start building PyPy, it starts going through Mandelbrot sets and all these things. I'm starting to get terrified because I already hate make files and you know, they might as well just put like a keep out sign on it so <laughs> saying go away. But what, what is actually happening here is pretty amazing. Um, okay, well first, first of all the facts, this movie is running 64 times faster than normal. It actually takes a few hours to do this. Um, just in contrast, building C Python takes about 90 seconds on this machine, so it's, it's significantly longer build time. What it's actually doing, oh, oh, actually one thing before we get to that, one immediate problem is actually finding enough RAM to do this. Um, I only actually have two machines where I can build this thing. One is my laptop with eight gig of RAM, and the other is an Amazon 2 extra large instance with 17 gigabytes of RAM. So. Um, uh, finding a machine to build PyPy is a little bit of a challenge if you want to do that. Um, now, what it's actually doing under the covers is it's actually taking PyPy and turning it into C code. Uh, if you go look at it, it actually creates 10 and a, almost 10 and a half million lines of C code spread across 800 files. Uh, it's about 350 megabytes of source. Um, that's, what you, that's actually what it's doing right now is it's basically writing out getting ready to write C code out. Um, one, one consequence of that is it does take a lot of memory and it might actually break the C compiler. Um, I've had that uh, happen on a number of occasions where you compile it, it totally breaks your C compiler uh, in, in the process of that. And you look at that and, and you, one of the things that you might look at, you, you would see that and say, well, that's just insane. I'm gonna run away from it. You can also look at it and say, well, that's just amazing. Uh, dare you say diabolical, you know, my favorite word there. I mean, it's, it's a very intimidating part of PyPy Pi, Pi, if you're gonna do it. And so what I wanted to do is actually kind of take you um, into the bowels of that a little bit and just sort of see, well, what, what's going on there? So, um, so one of the things that, that you, sh you should know if you're going to tinker with the PyPy project is that it's implemented in a subset of Python called RPython. Um, and this is actually something that I found really confusing as an outsider. I'd always heard that, I'd, 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 I'd always heard that, R, that PyPy was implemented in this quote, RPython. And you know, I had never really looked at it very deeply, and to me, I always thought, oh, maybe R Python is like this special interpreter, kind of like C Python. You know, it's like a special interpreter, or maybe it's instrumented in some way, and, and something like that. Um, that's not what's going on at all. It turns out that this R Python is just a restricted subset of the Python language that runs as Python code, but it's not really. That, that's about the only similarity. And 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 pinning down what R Python is turns out to be a little bit tricky. I, I'm having a little bit fun, uh, fun at the PyPy guys at their, uh, on their documentation here. One of the things that they write is that R Python is basically everything that will go through the translator, which is kind of another way of saying that Python is everything that runs without a traceback. Okay, it's not really, it's a little bit hard to kind of, you know, to like pin that down, you know, it's like, mm, okay. Um, so you can go reading about this. I mean, there are, there are papers and stuff. Um, there's, you know, a fair amount of documentation on, on what's happening here. Um, to be honest, uh, I actually find the documentation a little bit hard to read just at first glance because it assumes knowledge of a lot of different parts of the project. Okay, so you, you might have to read that multiple times. Um, there are some papers that kind of give you these high level pictures. But as, but as far as like hacking on PyPy, this is only tangentially useful, I think. You know, it's, it's like a high level view, but it's a little bit hard to dig my brain into it. Um, if you dare, you can go look at the detailed tech report. I probably never should have looked at this. Uh, if you can't read that in the back, they can't read it any better in the front. Uh, <laughs> but um, th this, is from, uh, this is from a tech report from funding, I think, from the EU. Uh, so PyPy had some funding. Uh, to be fair, they had to write it like that to get funding. So, you know, like, uh, I'm a, as an ex-academic, if they didn't write it really confusing like that, they wouldn't get any money. So, um, so, so you can look there. Uh, you can look at the source code, but that's also pretty daunting. It's like, uh, it's, it's like 4,500 Python files, um, about 1.25 million lines of source, not counting, I mean, not counting blank lines. And it's like just jumping into that is sort of daunting as well. 
Um, there are some blogs about that. Actually, I would pitch these as sort of a starting point. There's a, a tutorial on writing an interpreter with PyPy that somebody put together. There's a recent paper sort of talking about that. So, that, so there, are some, there are some ways to kind of to sort of jump into it. And what I thought I would do here, instead of just talking about it, is just do it. Um, I don't know whether anybody downloaded the, the source to, uh, to, to PyPy this morning, but I thought I would just do a demo of like, what is this RPython business? I mean, what is the deal with RPython, the language that makes up this PyPy project? So um, to start that out, I'm just going to write a really simple hello program in Python, OK? So this is. Um, Okay, this is the little main program. And then if you've done Python programming for a while, um, we'll put the little, little check here. Okay, so this, this, is, this is very simple little Python program. You, if, you've, if you're coding, you should be able to figure that out. Um, I'm just going to run it to make sure, that it, make sure that it works. Okay, Python program works. Now, one of the things that, that, that you would ask at this point is, how does, how does something like that get handled by this PyPy tool. I mean, what, you know, I'm talking about this RPython subset. How does that work? Turns out to use RPython, what you need to do is you need to add just a single function to this that looks like this. Um, what is going on here is this is sort of just identifying the start of your program. It's saying, okay, where's the entry point to your program? And if you've done a little, a little bit of programming in like Java or C, this is going to start looking very familiar. I mean, if you know about like C or Java, you know that you have to write a main function, and you know that the main function has to take like the command line arguments, and you know that it has to return like an integer. I mean, this is this is like low-level C code. This is what's going on here. It's basically, okay, we're specifying an entry point there, and in order to process this, instead of running it, I mean, this is where a lot of confusion comes up. There, there is no program called RPython. Like, I don't say RPython hello, because no such thing exists. Okay, it's like, what is that? Essentially, what you have to do is you have to run this through the translate program that we did earlier. So to do that, what I'm gonna do is just make a, I'm gonna make a little sim link to that, just because it's, uh, I don't wanna keep typing it all the time. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna take like the translate script out of the PyPy project and just make it available locally. What you can do is you can just say, okay, let's just translate hello.py. And if you do that, what it's doing at this point is it's taking your Python code and actually literally turning into C code. So it's compiling, it's actually very intimidating what it's doing here. I mean, it's like, we, we're only having like a little, you know, seven line program and it's kind of churning away on it for a, for a while there, uh, you know, generating C. Okay, so 18 seconds later, and you can look at this and say, okay, there's, there's it, made, it basically made a, a file called hello.c. You run it and you get your hello world. Okay, so essentially it's taking Python code, turning it into C code uh, to do that. Um, it just as a, little, as a little bit more um, sort of complicated version of this, um, Okay, let, 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 let's do something very useful. This is the most practical application in the world, right? We're gonna do, we'll do Fibonacci numbers because it's, uh, uh, it's, so, it's so useful here. Okay, am I, uh, I mean, it's having trouble hitting the control key there. Okay. Um, yeah, th th this, this is the, the, the very useful uh, version of this, so. If we, if we were at a node conference, we'd be doing, doing this async, of course. So, uh, okay. so, um, so, the, uh, the, uh, so what, what we're going to do here is we'll just print out like the... Uh, the uh, okay, there, there, there's like a different version of this. Um, so this is, this is uh, code which I hope computes like a Fibonacci number on the command line. And just to sort of see what this, this R Python is giving you, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just time like, like how long it takes to run this just using like a normal Python, uh, the normal Python interpreter, okay? So this is, this is gonna compute 36 Fibonacci number using a horrible algorithm, by the way. Kind of do that, did that on purpose. Um, you'll run this and it comes back and says, eh, okay, it takes like eight seconds. Now, if we run this through the, through the translate program and wait, you know, the, the obligatory 20 seconds here, okay, so we gotta, Gotta, gotta watch that, Draw, start starting drawing, drawing fractals and things. Um. It's a good way to intimidate your friends while you uh, <laughs> do that. Okay, so 18 seconds. What this is gonna do is it's gonna make a C program 
that will run the Fibonacci number, and we'll just time that, 0.17 seconds. Okay, so, so the, big thing, the, the, the big thing that you're getting, um, looks like I'm a little bit off the side of the screen there, um, is you're getting significantly better performance on that. I mean, essentially, it's taking your, your Python code, and it's taking it to C code. In fact, you can actually look at that C code if you're, in, if you're extremely insane, actually. Um, so if you uh, were to, to uh, like copy this, the, the directory where it, where it put that, you will go, um, you, you can drop down and sort of see a bunch of C files that get, that get generated by this. Um, I believe that the, that, the, that the function is actually in this file called uh, implement.c, and you can do a search for the Fibonacci code in there and see what you, uh, see what you find. That's what it looks like. It's not very readable. It's got lots of go-tos in it. Um, wouldn't muster probably code review if you were to <laughs> write like that. But, um, but, it, but it is turning it down into C code uh, un underneath the cover. Uh, now, now one, one of the big picture things about this as well um, that I wanted to do, I actually have a C version of this program that I sort of wrote in advance here. Um, so th this is just C code that does the same thing. If I run this through the C compiler and then time that, It's actually slower than what our Python made. Now, um, okay, so now, now, now in, the, in the defense of the C compiler, um, I did not specify any optimization, okay? So if I do some optimization on it, I can still come down a bit, okay? So, but, but essentially, our Python, I mean, it's, 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 it's taking Python, it's taking down to C, you're getting performance comparable to C. And really, the big idea on that project is that they can write the Python interpreter in this Python-like language and take it down to something that's comparable to C Python. I mean, that's really what they're what they're doing with that. So, so, so that's a little bit, you know, a little bit of a taste of of what's going on. Now, there are some things that you, that you cannot do. I wanted to actually illustrate just a few of the limitations of R Python. One of the things that that you do not get is you do not get any of the dynamic features of Python. There's, there's a reason why it's called restricted. So, for instance, if you had a, um, like, let's say you had, like, a list of nums, you know, one, two, three, four, and you said for x in nums, you know, print x, that will actually work fine. But if for some reason I were to, to make that list have something like a string in it, that would actually blow up our Python because it, it, essentially it's, it's like a type-checked version of Python and it actually expects things to be kind of a consistent type. Just to sort of see, um, you know, what would happen with that, just so you know, um, if you have any kind of type error in the system, um, it will actually blow up with a fairly big traceback that looks something like that. I mean, it will hit that. Um, it takes a little bit of time to kind of, to kind of figure out what's going on, but it's essentially complaining that you have inconsistent types in the, in, in the type system. So, uh, so, so to kind of to sort of summarize this, this, this sort of aspect of it, um, you know, this R Python, it's, it's kind of this restricted set of the Python language that they use to implement the Python interpreter. There will be a quiz later, by the, uh, <laughs> by the way. Um, one other thing that, I, that I, I just wanted to throw in here real quick um, as well, um, is that this, this R Python also has the ability to talk to C code. Um, because it's kind of going to C, there are hooks to make it kind of talk to the rest of the world. I thought I'd just sort of show an example of that um, uh, so you can see what that looks like. Um, essentially, there is sort of a whole low-level like remote function in, 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 interface. Uh, if you've ever used something like C types, R Python actually does something similar to that. Essentially, you can say things, hey, I want to I wanna call like the, uh, you know, the, the, the sign function from the, uh, the, you know, the C library, and then you can sort of attach like a type signature to it. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that I actually remember this correctly, okay? So, so you, you, can do th you can do things like that. I don't know, let's just try it. Okay, so what, if, what I'm doing here is I'm actually declaring like an external function from C and just bringing it into my program. Um, and then what I'm doing is, is calculating that down here. Okay, let's, let's just try this and see what happens. Um, that's another aspect of this, uh, of this Py, you know, the, the R Python. Basically, it has the, the ability to sort of go to the outside world and then call external function. It's a built-in. It's a built-in pause for me to rest here. Yeah.
Oh, it's not a Python program anymore. Okay, so um, okay, so now you're getting like values of the sine function. So that's that's a little bit of a taste of that. Um, you know, it's essentially they have you know this this R Python. It's, it's it's essentially a completely different language almost. I mean, it's actually it's it's Python syntax, but it's really like working in a compiled language. You have to compile it, you have to translate it. Um, it it's a little bit restricted. One thing that you should know is that if you love Python, you probably hate R Python. Just say that up front. It's it's not a very pleasant environment to work in. Um, but that that is the language, the language of, of PyPy. Um, one of the things that it's doing, just so you know, a little illustration of it, is that it is using something known as type inference to uh, process your code. Essentially, what it does is it looks at your code, and it sees how you use types, and it says, oh, there's an int there. Oh, so that must be an int. Oh, and you're returning an int, and that's an int. And you know, it's, essentially, what it's doing is it's looking at your code and just applying types across it. And you really need to think like C programming if you're going to do that. And so what ends up happening is you need to think about what happens with this with your whole program. Um, essentially, what, what, what our Python is doing is it looks at this whole implementation of PyPy, and it just starts walking the code doing type inference. So it sort of starts with that main function, and you can think about it just exploring like every single branch of your program until it finds all reachable uh, uh, places of code. And if you want to imagine sort of, you know, like one of the things to imagine is like what happens with that if you're doing like tens of thousands of functions. That is actually what's going on in that build process, is it's sort of walking every single possible control flow branch of the entire PyPy interpreter and figuring out what to do with it. It's actually pretty mind-blowing, actually, that it, that it does that. Um, just to, just the, and, and, and sort of a key insight on understanding PyPy is that um, all of the code that can be reached doing that is actually what this R Python language uh, pertains to. So what ends up happening is uh, it takes the source of, of PyPy, gathers the whole thing up, translates it to C, and then writes out an executable. So that, that's what's going on in the, in the build process of PyPy. And it's actually, I actually find it staggering that they're doing that. I mean, it's, it's so amazing what's, what's happening there. I think it deserves kind of obligatory, like Dr. Strangelove uh, uh, reference there. I mean, if you look at that, it's like, you know, just completely blow your head up, uh, sort, of, sort of looking into that. Um, and so, so understanding that part of, uh, part of PyPy, it is, it is something that's very, uh, very intense. Um, fully understanding it is probably very difficult. Um, I don't know whether it has like souls of PhD students in there or, or, or whatever, but, I, but that, that is a, that's a little bit of a taste of what it's doing. Um, one of the other things that I, that I wanted to do is actually just talk a little bit about what it does under the covers. I actually got interested in this early on, and it was probably a mistake to go digging under that, you know, lifting up that rock to sort of see what was there. There, but um, essentially, what one of the things that happens is you might look at, th at that translator and say, "Well, how does that thing work? Like, like, what does it do? Does it uh, does it take your Python code and does it parse it through a compiler or something like that? You, mean, you might look at that and say, "Oh, does it take my functions and and run it through like a lexer and a parser and all, and all that?" Um, turns out that it does not do that. Um, what it what it does is it actually it, it actually knows that it, it basically inside it says, "Hey, Python already parsed all this code for me." Why would I do it again? And it turns out that it doesn't even operate off source code. I mean, this is actually very mind-boggling about that, that tool. It, does not, it never even looks at your source code. Um, what it does is it operates entirely off of code objects. Now, this is a little bit subtle, but um, one of the things that you might know about Python is that when you write functions, they get compiled down into bytecode. And that bytecode is what goes in a PYC file, amongst other things. Turns out that that is what that translator tool looks at. It looks at bytecode and translates it directly from that. Um, and so here, here's kind of the, the big picture on it. If you know how Python works, essentially what Python, what CPython does is there's a little bytecode interpreter. It runs bytecode, okay? So it, it runs those code objects. That is what PyPy is doing as well. It turns out that in PyPy, there is a bytecode interpreter as well. It just happens to be written in Python. Okay, that, that's actually the whole point of the project, right, is to write Python in Python. So there's a Python bytecode interpreter in there. And what they do, and, th and this is just like utterly mind-boggling, um, it turns out that the PyPy bytecode interpreter is modular enough that they literally lift it out and put it into the translate program. And then they use it to run your program in the abstract. Um, if you think about this too long, what you'll end up finding is that PyPy translates itself into C using itself. Okay, so 
you know, and you need like this. This is where like a coffee addiction helps, you know, or five-hour energy or something like that. So uh, it's probably best not to think about it too much. But that's that's that's, that's insane if you look at look at the code. Um, and really, what it's doing, just to kind of give you a sense on it, is it's running the bytecode of the program kind of in the abstract instruction by instruction, and then it just sort of makes, it sort of records what ends up happening, and then it reconstructs the structure of your program as a huge graph. Um, and then it takes that graph, and then it drops it into C code. Um, I'm going to not go into further details about that, <laughs> other, than, other than to say that it's really, uh, really hairy there. Okay, so. Everybody okay with that? And in the, how about you in the back? You okay with that? Okay. So, um, so, so that's 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 what's that, that's that's what it's doing. Um, now, one of the one of the problems that I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about some of the problems that I've had trying to figure this out um, as an outsider coming into PyPy. One of the the tricky parts is that everything is in Python. I don't. Has anybody ever had that thought? Like you wake up in the morning, and you're like. Boy, it would be really cool if everything was Python, like the operating system and the compiler and the, and the shell and the, you know, the network stack and the browser. And it's like, you will love PyPy if that's what you, if you ever wake up like that, because literally everything is in Python. And um, that actually makes it very difficult to sort your head around it, because it turns out that a lot of the implementation, you have Python files where there's two different programming languages existing at the same time that both have Python syntax, but different semantics, okay? So you might have some file where it's like full Python and some of it, and R Python and other parts of it, and you have this question of like, well, which one is it? It's, it would be kind of like the same, not to, not to pick on PHP, it'd be kind of like the same if like PHP had the same syntax as HTML, right? You know, it's like, I mean, like how, you know, like, like what? Well, it wasn't meant to be a low blow. I mean, no, this is tricky, though. I mean, it's like if you have like two different languages with the same syntax in the same file, that's a little, a little bit tricky. I, I, can, I can tell you what the PyPy guys do. Um, these doc strings pretty extensively. So um, you will see. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's like they, they, they will put a doc string in there saying, this is not our Python. And they will actually, it's actually enforced in the translator. Like, if that translate script even hits anything with that in there, it will break. It will, it will basically say, no, you know, I'm not going to do it. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's like a, yeah, I'm going to feel bad comparing it to PHP there. Okay. Well, so, so, but, it, but it, it is, you know, it, it's a really tricky thing to wrap your brain around. Um, and then if you even think about it further, you sort of think, like, well, why, why would you even do that? Like, why would you write code that has, like, both normal Python and R Python in it at the same time? I mean, that's, that, that's sort of insanity. Um, what's going on here is that there are actually two different execution contexts for Python, for code in PyPy. There's basically the context of the translator, and there's the context in the final executable. And essentially, the code separates at translate time into one of those two things. And really what's going on here is that the C executable has implementation code, and the translator has metaprogramming in it. And what I mean by metaprogramming is things like decorators, meta classes, exec, things like that. Um, and just as an example, I mean, th this is the kind of thing that you might find. I mean, this is just you know, an example of what a decorator looks like in, in Python. So you, maybe you have a decorator function. You would actually have this thing split up like that. Okay, we're like, the decorator itself is Python, but the wrapper is R Python, and the application of the decorator is Python, and the function is R Python. Again, this is like really, really, really tough to wrap your brain around unless you've been like in this project for a long time, and I think it's like a really critical thing about understanding the, the code that's in there. So, uh, so, so as far as sorting this out, I mean, you, you, you have to get this sort of mental picture about like, okay, what happens when? Like generally, anything that takes place at import time is part of the translator, and anything that's, that's reachable through that entry function, that's what our Python is. Very difficult to kind of keep it straight. Um, the other thing that I, that I would sort of throw out there, there's, there's even more to this. Um, there's a whole aspect of our Python that concerns access to foreign code. I gave a little example of that earlier, but there's like a configuration system. Um, it can do things similar to autoconf. Not to, you know, I don't know that you've done autoconf, but it can, it can do things like discovery from the C compiler. Um, rather than talk about that, I, I thought I'd actually just throw you into some like real, R, like real PyPy code and just sort of just to see what you found. Um, just because this is, this is meant to be sort of a diabolical talk, um, why don't we, um, 
go into the thread library. <laughs> okay, so uh, so this is uh, this is this is code from uh, from PyPy. You can sort of see what it looks like. Um, there, there's some other challenges too. There's a lot of imports, a lot of sub modules that you need to uh, to look at. But what you will see is things like um, things like this. Actually, this little bit this little bit of code here. This is actually a uh, PyPy source doing autoconf make file stuff. It's actually going out and discovering things about the C about the thread library. So you'll see things like it's specifying oh like C header files, um, include directories. Um, it's looking for different uh, different things, declaring external functions. Here's a, here's an example of this like not R Python thing. Okay, so you have some source where it's saying okay that is not R Python, um, and this is this is more calling out to C. Um, Oh, the gill. Okay, let's look at that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, well, I'll come back to that. Okay. So, um, but this, you know, the, 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 this is what a lot of the code, you know, looks like. That's, there's a lot of this, these are some metaprogramming features. Like you see a lot of use of decorators, basically. And you know, like the, in this decorator, keep in mind that's part of basically the translator. The function is part of R Python. Again, very, very difficult thing to kind of kind of sort out. So, so that's 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 what a lot of the lot of the code looks like. And how, how am I doing on time, by the way? Am I? Uh... Okay. okay. Um, so, so one of the quandaries that I had um, at this point, you know, so I, I sort of got to this point in the talk, and I'm like, how am I going to end this talk? Because um, I sort of feel like I haven't even really told you anything about PyPy. I, like, I haven't told you how the JIT works. I haven't, like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different pieces to it. So how, how in the world am I going to end this thing? Um, and then I kind of had this, this realization that, I just don't even know how it works yet. I mean, I, it's, I, I feel somewhat, um, I feel sort of somewhat defeated by the thing. You know, like if you were to ask me, well, how does the PyPy JIT work? No idea. I mean, other than what they've told me at conferences and, and, and so forth. So it's a little bit defeated. Um, but then I sort, of, I sort of started thinking about it, and it's like, I don't even know how C Python works. Okay, now you, you could say, okay, how the hell is this guy giving a keynote talk if he doesn't know how C Python works? <laughs> um, but, it's, but it's true, though. It's like, like if you were to ask me like, about how a lot of different parts of C Python work, I don't know. Like, how does, like, how does the Unicode databases, how's that implemented? I don't know. Or how's the, uh, you know, it, it's like C Python's a big program. I haven't looked at all that. And it's, you know, it's, you know, I, I don't know how all of it works. So, okay, you can say, okay, how's, you know, Dave up here? Uh, Talk, talking about this, but I, I think like the, the 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 critical thing is that I know how to use the tools that make up C Python. That's really the, the the critical aspect of this. I know about ANSI C. I know about make files. I know about autoconf and algorithms and data structures and things. And so and so even though I don't know how all of C Python works, I know how to go into it and find out how it works. So if I want to know how the GIL works, I can go in there and find out how it works. Or if I want to know how um, you know like you know, the, like this, you know, the regex module works or something. There, there's tools to kind of do that. And I think that that is really the challenge going into PyPy that you have to kind of overcome. It's that that project is basically using a different set of tools than you're used to. And unless you're comfortable with those tools, it's just going to be this impenetrable fog of stuff. And it's, and it, it's like you really need to know about, you know, what this R Python thing is. You need to know about translation. You need, to have, you need to be really up on Python metaprogramming stuff, like decorators and meta classes and other stuff. It's basically a different vocabulary. I mean, that's the way to think of it. And if, unless you have that vocabulary, you're just not going to be able to mess around with it. So, so with that said, you know, this question of how to end the talk, um, I sort of realized that uh, I actually used to be a professor. This is actually something that somebody wrote on my whiteboard when I was teaching operating systems. Um, not quite sure what to... Uh, to make of that. So, um, having been a professor, I, I thought I would end it by just leaving it as an exercise to you <laughs> to go figure out how Python works. So, um, isn't that what professors do when they get near the end of the lecture? They're just like, uh, or, or if they don't know, that's even better. They'll leave it as an exercise. So, um, so, so that's kind of the the, the end of, of that part of the talk. I did want to put a little bit of a postscript on this whole thing by talking about Ruby. Like, okay, where, the, where is this going? Okay, so, um, yeah, Ruby. Um, one of the things that you know is that um, I like to break global interpreter locks a lot. You know, I wake up in the morning and it's the first thing I think about most. No, not really, but uh, I've done a lot of work like looking at the Python gill and, and things like that. And one of the things um, that I kind of noticed, I did, I did a, a benchmarking on some thread stuff. Um, 
And I came across this benchmark where it's like, okay, Ruby, 3,600 times slower than Python, okay, on some thread benchmark. And I'm not willing, okay, the, I know, I'm not willing to accept some weird result about Ruby and just say, okay, Ruby sucks or something like that. Because like, something is going on with that. And the question is, what is it, okay? And I did that. I mean, actually, I was invited to speak at the RuPy conference, which is like a Ruby Python mixed conference. I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool. Let's go look at the Ruby Gill. Um, I'm not a Ruby expert. I downloaded the source code for it, but I was able to kind of look at their 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 Gill in pretty short order, like an hour or two. It's like find it. It's like, oh, okay, and mess around with it. Um, I will say that that performance problem that they have there is a, a more extreme example of a performance problem that Python 3.3 has. That's a topic for a different talk, but it's, uh, you know, I went in there and filled it around with it. Um, and just to be clear about that, I could not write a Ruby program right now to save my life, okay? I mean, if you asked me, oh, Dave, you're gonna die unless you write like some Ruby program up here, I'd be, that'd be over, it'd be game over. So, but, but, but the thing is, I had like basically the vocabulary to go in there and understand it, like basically C code and how to tinker with it, and how to look at it, and the whole reason that I did this talk is that I encountered that same problem in PyPy. It was basically totally lost with trying to figure out why. I mean, it was, you know, I had a benchmark with PyPy maybe a year ago. Um, similar performance, I went to look at it, and I just felt completely beat up about it. I mean, it went into the source, and it's like, I'm way out of my league here, uh, because I, did, I just don't have any basis for understanding what's happening. Um, and so, that was really kind of, you know, the, the, the maybe the inception of this talk is, you know, maybe I need to, you know, do a little side project to figure out what is going on with PyPy to see whether you can tinker with it. And, you know, and by presenting it, maybe, you know, sort of having other people kind of get a little bit of a, a you know, head start or a, a jump on it if you wanted to do it yourself. So, uh, so some parting words on the talk, um, you know, this question of can you tinker with PyPy, I'm not sure. Okay, I'll, I'll be honest, like, you know, it, it's, an, it's a non-trivial thing to go in there, but I think you should do it anyway, uh, partly because it's a cool project. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of neat things in there. Um, they, they, need some, they need more love, too, you know, any more, more people on IRC asking questions and stuff. So uh, there's a lot of neat things in there. Um, if you go in there, you might find some things uh, that they are kind of wild. Or VMs, I, I don't know. It's full of stars or VMs. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the end of the talk. Um, I, I guess my hope is that you learn at least one new thing by uh, sort of going through that, or at least just kind of an idea of what that project involves. If you ever want to mess around with it, um, just some just some special thanks. Alex Gainer and Magic did help me out with some occasional questions on Twitter and, 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 and things like that. I also tried this out at the Chippy meeting for a couple of, couple of months. There's, some, there's some, actually some extra talks you can find online that has me going into more detail behind the scenes of what's going on. If you're interested in that, uh, you can look at that. So I think that's, that's it. Uh, I don't know where I am on time, but uh, we can probably, we have time for questions or? Uh, uh, no time for questions. No time for questions. No, nobody's gonna ask me about copyright or anything? Okay, okay so. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>